Uh, I'm ridiculously pleased to be introducing Tressie McMillan <coughs> Cotton. Uh, Tressie is a fourth year PhD candidate in sociology at Emory University. She studies inequality in rapidly changing social domains like education, new media, and technology. This summer, she's a PhD intern at the Social Media Collective at Microsoft Research New England, just down the street. If you do not know Tressie already, do yourself a favor. After this talk is over, go to tressiemc.com, click on Most Read Essays, and then work your way down that list. <laughs> you, will, you will come to understand exactly why in 2013 the nation named her a top feminist writer of the year, and the Huffington Post included her in their list of best publications of the year. Uh, you will also learn a lot, at least I did. Yesterday, uh, she put up a primer post for today's talk, and in case you missed it, I'm just going to quote uh, the key paragraph, I thought, uh, which is, she says, I talk to students that are cobbling together alternative higher education models of disruption as they live at intersecting processes of inequality regimes. This is the counter history of disruption that isn't about roaming autodidacts, but about rank and file women and women trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents financed at 6.21% and amortized over 15 years. Uh, Tressie has a book coming out, Lower Ed, The For-Profit College Fix from the New Press. Tressie McMillan Cotton. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. It's always so odd to um, remember that there are people on the other side of <laughs> all that stuff. The only way that I know how to respect my audience is to pretend that you don't exist when I'm writing, right? So <laughs> that way I don't assume anything about you. I pretend like it's not there, right? And uh, I really do <laughs> approach it that way. And then these things happen and I'm like, oh yeah, there are people in that machine and uh, they have sometimes been to the website and they have read and I'm very appreciative of that. So I'd like to thank Tim for that very kind um, introduction and for reading uh, the website and directing everyone else there. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone uh, connected here with the Berkman Center for inviting me. And I will also start with a couple personal programming notes. So uh, a couple things that you should know about me. I always tell my students, right, to interrogate um, uh, the researcher, interrogate the person in the text. And so if we assume that this is all some big living text, right, I'll save you time. That way you don't have to try to figure out where I'm coming from. I'll just tell you. One, I'm a sociologist. That means I think that groups are a level of analysis also means that I think about things like inequality and stratification, all right? You might want to know that I am Southern both by culture and by choice. And so for our purposes, thank you very much. And so for our purposes here today, what that means uh, maybe for you is that I'm perfectly comfortable. I come from a call and response tradition. Right? That means you do not have to sit out there and me up here. You can feel free to be in dialogue as I go through the talk. The only thing that I will say is that if at times I say, well, we might be coming to that, or I really, really want to kind of move us to Q&A as efficiently as possible, uh, I may ask you to hold off if I think that we might cover it in some other way. But other than that, I know we all come from different disciplinary norms, but that tends to be mine, OK? Uh, let's see, so, oh, one other programming note. I always have to thank my very generous the primary funder um, for her ongoing uh, support. That would be my mother, Vivian, <laughs> who I think is at home now watching this streaming live if she figured out what streaming is. And so everybody will say hello, Vivian. <laughs> Y'all just got me out of a Christmas gift, and so I thank you. Um, so uh, a, a quick lay of the land of how I hope that this will go. So first I'm going to start kind of broad, right? By what I mean by inequality regimes, democratizing ideologies. After I put the um, uh, the the sort of description of the talk together for the for Berkman, I thought that is really clunky sounding, and it is. Um, but I hope it's specific enough in a way that it facilitates a very specific kind of conversation. So I'm always trying to do that dance between um, right using disciplinary language and jargon and these really specific terms, and trying to keep the conversation as open to as many people from different disciplinary backgrounds as um, as possible. Uh, I'll try to walk that line here today. Again, you can always feel free to call me out on that as we make our way through. So broadly, I'll start with what do I mean by those things. Um, and I'm going to juxtapose that against where I think we are in this broader sort of social, cultural, political moment, right? And this is where I think we are. Uh, we've got unprecedented access to information. 
uh, to services, to markets, um, and that's almost entirely a function of technological change. Um, but we are also living in an ideological moment of uh, this idea of meritocracy um, that is really all too happy to assume that all of the t what I call technocratic solutionism which we'll talk about a little bit what I mean by that, right? That it will just sort of magically erase um, persistent inequalities, particularly as they relate to group inequality, right? Um, we just don't talk about it in, uh, in this cultural moment. So we build tools, so part of my argument is, we build tools that do not consider it. Um, and not considering inequality is not the same as there not being inequality. It just means you cannot observe it, measure it, or theorize it. And so when you cannot measure it, theorize it, theorize it or, or observe it, what you really end up doing is perpetuating it, right, will be sort of my larger argument. Now, my personal work has focused um, on higher education, uh, especially emerging higher education models, and I talk a lot about for-profit colleges in my work as being sort of um, th this sort of ideal type of market-based higher education models, right? And so when I say for-profit colleges, does it ring a bell with anyone in the room? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the University of Phoenix, Strayer, get off your couch, call today, start tomorrow. All right. Uh, now, I, there's work in that area, and there's a reason why I choose to do that. But my work in particular talks about sort of how race, class, and gender sort of intersect with what kind of students are making the choice to attend these sort of emerging higher education models which are almost entirely being uh, um, devised and funded in the private sector. These are market-based solutions to what people would say is an unmet um, consumer demand for higher education. That's the line you kind of hear, right? Um, so the spoiler alert version of that work, again, very broadly, is this. Uh, as there have been fewer good jobs with good wages, workers want to earn credentials to try to stay afloat, right? Uh, where that intersects with my work is that the more dire the job prospects are, whether they think that is uh, the case in reality or whether per people perceive that their prospects are particularly dire, right, be that due to any kind of systemic bias, right, racism, sexism, classism, ableism, what have you in the labor market, the more insecure people feel, the more they're willing to pay for the credential, right? That's, that's just the, that's the short version of the takeaway. So I spent a lot of time doing things like reading SEC filings, um, that for-profit colleges have filed over the last 20 years. Um, thank you, and I love them. Um, I really do, and I actually suggest that you do it. I call them really great examples of creative nonfiction. <laughs> because think about what they have to do, right? They've got to both sell you and imagine what they will be without making any promises that they can be held too liable for. I mean, that takes some really creative sort of language and sort of manipulation of things in these documents. But it also gives you a really keen insight into how they view their role in sort of the overall process of things, right? And so one of the things that comes out when you're reading the ones that are um, being filed uh, around like the mid-1990s to 2000, 2001, which was this really... Um, uh, um, condensed period of sort of financialization in the sector, lots of money being poured into for-profit colleges and expanding them. That's why you woke up one day and saw the commercials everywhere, right? For-profit colleges that already existed, they just sort of permeated our awareness uh, one day. It felt like you woke up and they were everywhere. That's what happened. A lot of money got poured into them, what Kevin Kisner calls the Wall Street era of for-profit colleges. Well, you read them, and one of the things I like is they always have to list who they think their major competitors are in the market, right? Because this is about pr um, prospective investors and kind of getting an idea of the company's uh, market position. And so what you, you would suspect that a school would list other schools as their primary competitors. Mm -hmm. And some of them do, right? But some of them say, no, we're not really competing with the community college down the street. Or they say, well, yeah, no, there are a couple other for-profit colleges in the area, and they might prove to be some competition. But overwhelmingly, what they cite as their primary competition is jobs and military service. Mm -hmm. They're competing with jobs and military service. Uh, my takeaway from this is that the business plan is about expanding access to higher education. It's a democratizing ideology, right? Greater access. But the business plan absolutely is aware that what it is selling is relative to inequality. They know that inequality is part of the business plan, yeah? The fact that we don't know it and don't study it that way is something that I just kind of hope to address in my own work. But access to information in this sort of 
understanding uh, in the creative nonfiction ends up conflated with education and equality of outcomes. Yes. To what extent does inequality uh, get perpetuated by people getting interested in money they can't cover and, yeah. and getting credentials that ultimately don't have marketing value? Yeah, so the question was, to what extent does inequality get perpetuated by students taking on student loans that they, um, first of all, at a high rate and at high aggregate amounts, and then with lowered, uh, the lowered ability to repay them due to job market outcomes, and yes? Then, and, then, and then sort of corollary, to what extent can most students graduate? I mean, can they go in, take on debt, and then just absorb them? And the for-profit sector overall? In, in, these, in, these, in, this, in mm -hmm. this online structure. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we're going to want to tease apart a couple of things. So when I talk about, um, so online uh, education is not the same as for-profit colleges. There's significant overlap because of sort of the technological history of for-profit colleges, right? So we'll kind of want to separate those out. But if we just talk about the difference between students who are attending a for-profit college and uh, attending a not-for-profit traditional um, form of higher education, when we hold constant things like race, class, and gender, Actually, their dropout rates are comparable to those in community colleges, although those students would do better usually in a, a traditional four-year college. Um, so it becomes a really complicated picture. It, it, that suggests actually my overall point that inequality matters. It matters where students are starting as much as it matters of what they're getting once they're in the institution. But now none of that has anything to do with the fact that if you drop out and you owe $6,000, that is a much different position for you than if you drop out and you owe $60,000, right? So all of that is always relative. So one of my, um, so one of my arguments in the ongoing uh, conversation about student loan debt is that we think about debt as an absolute number, and debt is actually always relative. The experience of the debt is relative. Right? My $100,000 student loan debt is not going to be the same as somebody's $100,000 student loan debt coming out of Harvard Law School, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, right? Okay? So it's, it's relative. It's relative to where I started, and it's relative to my expected outcomes. One we know about where I start, the other we're always having to make assumptions about. Right? Yeah. So that's what, it is a primary means by which, yes, that inequality ends up reinforcing itself. Absolutely, is what I would argue. Um, so what I'm talking about there. So what do I mean though by inequality regimes and some matters we kind of move through um, because I am talking about something really specific. So uh, I, some of you may be familiar with this word, but I'm borrowing really heavily here from a rich literature on organizations and inequality that has particularly looked at race and class and gender. And it's just this idea that there are practices and processes that are interlocking that create and reproduce class gender and racial inequality in various combinations. The various combinations part matters. Because overwhelmingly what we tend to do in the literature, um, especially uh, the current literature about higher education and inequality, to the extent that when we do look at things like people's starting location in life, their social location, where they originate, we look at race, we look at class, we have a gender, we have these, um, these uh, quantitative measures for that, right? Um, and we tend to look at those independently from each other, right? So what we end up saying is, um, for instance, there's a paper out that says, well, no, the race is not a significant predictor for enrollment in for-profit colleges, but then that makes it really hard for us to explain why African-American and Hispanic students are overrepresented in for-profit colleges, right? So I say that this is not an issue with um, understanding the quantitative measures, it's that we reduce inequality to a single measure. Right? When you start to look at those things um, in combination or what, how they intersect, you actually get a much different empirical picture. And if we think about that analytically as looking at inequality regimes in these organizational contexts, where you choose to go to school, what happens to you when you get there, and how people respond to and perceive to you once you leave, we get a much different picture of how that inequality works. Uh, now, uh, I tend to look at this broadly. I've looked at how this works in... Um, uh, in on-campus programs, right? My work this summer has uh, looked at this more specifically and how this works when those uh, programs are happening online. So when these relationships are digitally mediated, we already know that something happens when we are online. So we tend to collapse space and time, right? Things, those uh, concepts tend to work a little more differently. That's why a lot of people choose to go online, quite frankly. They get to collapse time and space in ways that are convenient for their lives, right? If you are working, um, and you cannot afford to opt out of the labor market while you pursue another <coughs> credential, especially if the point of you getting the credential again is fear about job insecurity, right? What you're trying to do when you take those classes online is you're trying to take advantage of the ways that the technology collapses those things, right? 
Now, that's what we get from the literature. I think a broader story when we think about inequality regimes is what would motivate different people differently to need to do that, right? This is where these inequality regimes as an analytical framework become really important. And I say that this is a really great way for us to disentangle how things like the platform of the social media, whether you're taking it online or not. Um, the content and the ideology all kind of get collapsed into one thing analytically. And if we think about it this way, we can start to tease those differences apart. Now you see this tension between what I call access ideologies and inequality across all kinds of social domains. We see it in healthcare, right? Anybody remember the, uh, the big uh, debate about the uh, efficiency of the ACA marketplace website, right? We got so caught up in the fact that it wasn't as efficient as we liked that we kind of lost sight of the fact that there were some really serious warning shots that were fired a year prior about who even had access to and could navigate and could enroll online. Why we were depending so heavily on online access as a point of access for people who were most likely to be uninsured or tempor temporarily underinsured were generally coming from demographics and equality regimes that made their access to um, online technologies less likely. Right? That conversation gets lost when we focus on the platform. But these things like how inequality and ideologies then work together isn't just specific to education. Again, this is part of what I think is this larger moment, healthcare, political participation. Not sure anybody has been following the debate recently. The New York Times has decided to take up um, a uh, polling, um, uh, opinion polling sampling. Uh, they're going to take some up from uh, a company that uses online only participation to do participant observation, right, um, of political opinion. The debate being, who are, is this representative of who we are when we do this extreme amount of self-selection at the front end of the process? So we see this happening in political participation. We see it happening in housing and employment. But I think in the higher education uh, context, we get a really great comment on the gap between what we think we're doing when we increase access um, and what really happens when we think about inequality. This is from Jimmy Wells at Wikipedia. He says, imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. Doesn't get much more you know, uh, aspirational uh, of an ideology than that, right? One, one, the idea that we've got a sum of all human knowledge, I think would be news to some people. Um, but the other thing that I really like is this turn about every single person on the planet getting free access, right? Not groups of people, but every single person. Every single person. I think uh, at, underneath this all is this thing that, it, that permeates all the sort of emerging sort of higher education disruption models. I think this is what's underlying our belief in MOOCs as a disruptive model, that this is what underpinned our belief in for-profit colleges as this disruptive model, right? And it's this idea that if there are any differences among persons, it's about individual differences. And we can cure that if we've just got more information and access. Somehow access becomes education, becomes information, right? We start to conflate them as the same thing. Well, as a sociologist, first of all, I think some educational psychologists will have issues with that. Um, I know some, and I know that they do, but as a sociologist, I would take some issue with that. One is this idea that information is the education, right? <laughs> That information is education, right? We know that education is about what you bring from your social context that allows you to scaffold new information onto what you know, right? right. That's not about information, it's about where you begin and how you can then internalize it and synthesize it, right? That's an inherently social process is what we have found, right? Now we can define social kind of broadly, but we know that information alone doesn't get you there, right? Um, we also know that information is sort of culturally relative. <laughs> What's considered important information in one co cultural context can be quite different um, in another. And again, we've got all this literature and have had it for a very long time. There is no real re empirical reason that we should want to conflate access of information to education. But I would say that there's an ideological reason for people to want us to conflate the two. So if you end up here, we get, again, this. Uh, we get at what I think is the heart of the tension between ideologies and inequalities. And it's something that Justin Reich actually brought up. He did a talk here a few weeks ago about MOOCs um, and the science of learning that I was fortunate enough to attend. And he made this really excellent point about the limitations of all of that data that MOOCs are producing. 
right? They get data scientists and computational scientists really, really excited, right? Because they're talking about huge amounts of data. I think he said something about terabytes, right? And the room kind of shimmered a little, um, <laughs> right? So these, da these data are really great. You got people from all over the world taking them, we say, right? And we know so much about them and could know more if we use different types of technologies. And Justin kind of slowed it down and I really appreciated him. He said, well, you know, this data is really great about analyzing things like tasks, like how long you stay on a website or in a video, how long you watch a video clip, how long it takes you to respond um, to a question. He said, but it's actually not that great at figuring out what people have learned, right? And I appreciated that. And that is because, again, what people learn and what they know is quite different from these discrete tasks, these discrete bites of information. But for, by and large, the platforms that are underpinning some of the, most of our higher education disruption models, and I just like saying disruption because other people like saying it so much, <laughs> is, is this very idea that that's what learning can be reduced to, these tasks. So we get beyond even the single person in this model. We're not even talking persons anymore, right? We're talking routine tasks that we can break them out. Well, I think that when we break out tasks from the person, we not only lose the person, but we lose their cultural and social context, right? So how we decide to collect data becomes a political and ideological kind of tool that dissolves all of that stuff that a lot of people would really rather not think about anyway. Quite frankly, we're a little fatigued with the whole inequality train. I'll be honest with you, right? I mean, maybe you guys aren't. Maybe you're the good eggs. But, <laughs> but seriously, there is not a significant amount of interest anymore in kind of thinking about the ways in which different groups of people have different uh, amounts of access to things, right? This is why we like to think about solving the access problem will also solve the inequality problem. I think people would prefer to talk about access than they would inequality because that is a much, much tougher for not to crack. Um, so again, Justin made this point last week, but he also, and he made an, another one that I really liked. He said, well, not only are we reproducing sort of, you know, these inequalities when we don't consider where the people are kind of coming from and we focus instead on these discrete tasks and that's what most of this work is done. He said, but since we're then using that information to sort of refine the platforms and the digital tools, what we end up doing is risking tooling these models to the norm, is how I think he said it, right? That, that we'll end up retrofitting it to the norm. <laughs> and I really like this idea of the norm, because what is it exactly? We have some idea of what it is, and this is what I call it, roaming autodidacts, <laughs> what most of these models are designed for, really, right? But this is the norm that we're assuming in uh, a lot of this technological innovation and that we're building into the platforms and retooling to retrofit. The roaming autodidact is this idea that there is this ideal, self-motivated, able learner that is somehow simultaneously embedded in the future, always in the future of education, the jobs of the 21st century, the education of the 21st century, but are simultaneously disembedded from anything like place, culture, history, markets even, or inequality regimes. These people come to these learning tasks without any of this, and they pick up information, turn it into learning and education by some magic of the platform. We're able to then disaggregate that, to measure it, and then to respond, right? The roaming autodidact. I really like the roaming autodidact because I say, if you are tooling and designing tools for this person, Right? You've got some issues. People like to talk about scale. You don't get to scale with this person. Right? Seriously, if you could get to scale with this person, we never would have came up with schools as institutions, quite frankly. Right? This is why we have institutional spaces. So just to put that in the terms of what sometimes my um, market folks like, you're not going to get to scale this way. What you are going to get, I think, is a tool that then is used to measure the efficacy of the non-roaming autodidacts and are constantly going to find them at fault for not meeting this norm that's built into the platform of how we then understand learning and education. And I say that is probably likely to look a lot like the students that I talk to. Well, my students don't roam much. All right? I don't talk to a lot of roaming autodidacts, but they do roost, right? Yeah. When you can't just roam about the world uh, unencumbered, you tend to be embedded in these larger social processes and you tend to be looking for a place as much as you are a space, 
right? So they don't tend to roam around. So I tend to talk to students who are enrolled again in for-profit colleges. They are more likely to be black, to be Latino, to be first generation college students. They are more likely to be poor and so to need things like Pell Grants and student loan money to pay for it. Right? These are again, not roaming IDECs who are just looking for information um, or even just looking for education. They're looking for credentials, right? Because what they're really looking for is mobility. Right? And again, we don't even get to that conversation with the roaming IDECs. They, don't never, they never are concerned about upward mobility. They're already always where they're going to be. Because again, they're in the future. Right. Okay. So they're not here, they're not past, they're in the future. You don't need mobility there. All right. So these are the students that I talked to. So now I'll talk a little bit about um, my broader project, some of what I've worked on this summer, and then we'll move and I'm happy to open it up to, um, then to Q&A. Um, so again, in my uh, dissertation work and the work is sort of informing the book project, I've talked to um, about um, 60 or 70 students currently enrolled in a for-profit degree granting institution. Right? I've talked to them about things about how they made those choices, right? how they make meaning of them, how they now feel about it now that they're in that context. I talk about what the admissions process was like, what that financial aid process was like, what the classroom experience is like. I talk about how they think their employers are going to respond to their education and how their peer networks, their friends and their family members have received their educational choices. Right? And by and large, I get, I'm talking to women because women are overrepresented in all of higher education, but that is more acute as you start to get into non-traditional forms, right? Um, and what they're telling me aren't things like, I was interested in picking up physics, I always had an interest, <laughs> right? This is the kind of narrative that emerges again from some of the, um, the coverage on emerging higher education models, right? And they have plenty of interests, don't get me wrong, but that is not what is motivating them to participate. Instead, they tell me stories about how they have worked on a call center floor for eight years, and they have seen um, all of the men, disproportionately men, move up to things like supervisors and managers. And when you do that, you're less likely to work shift work. And if they can stop working shift work, they can be home when their kids get home from school. And so it seems like most of those people have a college degree, and they've decided they should get one too. right? They're talking about job insecurity, and they're talking about motherhood penalties. They're talking about persistent gender wage gaps. And they're talking about educational inequities that got ramped up from their K through 12 preparation. They're talking about low expectations of them, gendered norms of what it means to perform as a good mother and a good wife at home. And they're talking about how all of that constrains the choices available to them to get a degree. Right? These are not roaming autodidacts. I would also point out that they are the majority of all college students. All right. uh, they are the projected normal, actually, for traditional higher education. We assume that by 2020, most students will be like the types of students that I talk to. They will most certainly be browner, more likely to be women, and they will, be more likely to, they will be more likely to be older or have families. So the students I talk to are actually the students a lot of us will be teaching in a few years, and so I think it behooves us to understand them a little better. Uh, and again, I also think it behooves us to understand that how, it, how is it that we are imagining a higher education future that doesn't include them? What are we saying about what that will mean? Right? If all of, our, all of our visions of a higher education future is not at all about this student, but about this one, that's the minority, and this is the majority, we're making a pretty clear ideological statement about who a higher education is for. All right, so what do I know about some of these students? Uh, so I told you about them in on-campus spaces. This summer, however, I've look, been looking at students who are attending online programs and how they're using social media platforms to try to navigate some of those shortages that they find um, in their on-campus programs. And so those are shortages like very limited time to do the sort of social networking and to develop sort of social and cultural capital that we know helps turn information into education. Right? So when you're uh, doing an accelerated program in a non-traditional higher education format, even though you're sharing the same physical space, the students that I talk to say they don't spend a lot of time with each other. They spend even less time with uh, faculty and administrators. Some of that is just about the geography of the space. We're not talking about you know, sprawling campuses. These are usually occupying one or two floors of an office building and the like. So we're not talking about there being a lot of physical space for congregating. And there's also not a lot of time to do so. Again, the programs are accelerated. The courses are accelerated. You're in class from 6 to 9 at night. There isn't a whole lot of time to hang out in a quad so to speak, right? And those were some of those uh, um, social interactions are likely to happen. So I started asking, okay, so then where do you get this from, if you get it at all, 
right? If we take the, the idea of space out of the equation entirely and we look at students who are not just doing this on campus but who are doing it online, you get some of my students who are in a group that I call SWAG. That's because they say it about themselves. <laughs> and <laughs> it's an acronym for Successful we Women Achieving Greatness. And it is this, uh, it's a support group um, that says it is for women who are pursuing a PhD. And what I find really interesting about that is that it's open to all women pursuing a PhD. But the group is comprised of over 80% of the students are from for-profit schools. They're actually overwhelmingly from two for-profit schools. Right? <laughs> so there's already a lot of self-selection that suggests that there's something about participating in this form, this higher education context, that has led people to seek out sort of social supports in online spaces. Right? <clears throat> They're all pursuing their PhDs in an online program. right? And I focus on PhDs because we think of this as high educational attainment. right? If we looked at this as just a quantitative measure, once they're done, we'd say, well, now, here's a woman who has a PhD, and here's another one that does. And we wouldn't look at the qualitative differences between them at all, <laughs> right? So we have to look at the qualitative differences of how they achieved it and what kind of social stuff happened along that process is part of my larger argument. And once you get a, a look at who the students in the group are, you get things like almost uh, they're overwhelmingly married and have children or at least are partnered. And that's across race with some differences by race, right? So that gives you some idea, again, of what type of sort of social patterns they're dealing with, right? So again, they're dealing with motherhood. They're dealing with the responsibilities of being a wife or a female partner in a couple, right, that comes with all of these expectations, right? They are supporting a family or at least are contributing to a household budget that should support a family, right? Um, many of them are dealing with uh, um, relationship arrangements that are not particularly supportive of them pursuing um, an education, right? And so they have to take a lot of measures to make sure that they work the education around the role instead of changing their role in the relationship to work around their education. So by virtue of who they are, right, the members of SWAG have chosen an institutional affiliation. They've self-selected into a college and a college type, absolutely. But again, my argument is that, about, is that who they are greatly conditioned what options they were able to self-select into, right? And that we have to look at who they are to get at that information. And when we don't even collect that data, much less analyze it, then we lose all of this, right? So some preliminary analysis of what I know of how they use some of these spaces. So the first is that they are absolutely trying to make a place in these digital spaces. They do have some sense that they are missing out on the social connections and that having those social connections would make the education um, more fruitful for them. Trying to figure out how to create that though is very interesting. So you have someone um, like Jay who talks about how in her online program, you used to be obligated to comment on each other's posts in their online classes. It was part of their grade, right? Um, students complained about that, however, and so they, <laughs> they didn't want to. Um, uh, and the students in her courses, by the way, she says, you know, they don't, she doesn't necessarily know the gender and class and, um, and race makeup of the other students, but she has some sense that it was the students who were doing really well in class who didn't feel obligated to comment on each other's um, uh, content. She says, so they stopped, right? It's no longer um, mandated that the students have to interact with each other in this way in the online classes. And she said, you know, I really missed that. She said, there was no way for me to measure my progress, right? If I don't know what my fellow students were doing, I don't know how I'm doing. Right? Um, she said, so when they stopped this, she had to seek this out elsewhere. And so I asked her, okay, well, the, uh, the schools would love for them to use their corporate social media sites to do this. They have set them up. They have Facebook and Twitter feeds. They have proprietary um, 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 private uh, networks like Yammer that they use, right, that they would like the students to use. One, it gives them a better window into how their customers are perceiving their experience, right? It becomes a data mining um, exercise. Jay and Ellen and none of the other students I've talked to thus far want to use them in that way. Um, when I ask them why, this is not about a choice necessarily about platform, but about who they are. She said, there's no way uh, I would want to be in a group and talk about these things that matter to me. <laughs> yeah, I like that uh, too. Um, she says, you know, I said, so would you talk about these issues? She was having some problems with her financial aid. She had exceeded her financial, um, her federal um, financial aid loan limits, but she had not yet completed her degree. 
This is again about the context. She has financed $180,000 so far. So she's out of money that she can borrow that way. She needed to go to the private student loan market to finish. Um, very committed to finishing her degree. She comes to the online support group and I have watched this, um, this conversation unfold. Other members of the group co immediately come to her aid, one to commiserate with her experience, others to say, no, I've been in that position too. So one, it becomes normalized for her through interacting with students in the group. And then they start to turn to tacit and explicit information about how to overcome the problem. So they give her the name of a private student loan company and somebody else echoes in and says, no, I've used them. They're actually pretty good. So right, it gets legitimized through peer networks. Her peers have used it, they're on the up and up. Right. Um, and then somebody else comes along and says, and yeah, don't be too worried about your credit. Yeah, it needs to be good enough. But I had a couple issues on my credit report and I was still able to get a loan at this interest rate. So they're revealing sort of that private algorithm of uh, credit underwriting right to each other. She gets some idea of whether or not it's even worth <coughs> the risk and the, uh, of time and investment for her to pursue. Right. And she does end up getting, by the way, the student loan to continue um, her degree program. I asked her, well, would you have discussed this? in the other forms. And she said, no. And she says, no, look, I didn't even want to put my picture of my avatar. People told me not to do this in the online classes. She's like, because they'll know that I'm a black woman. And that comes with a whole lot of baggage. And it particularly comes with baggage relative to class. And if I start talking about how I've got money issues, mm -hmm. I've got concerns about my credit worthiness to people that I'm going to interact with and might need to depend on to get me through my degree progress, this might prime things in them that is going to compromise what kind of support I get, right? Right. Even online, who she is matters. Right. She did, however, end up using a picture because she said, shit, my name is Keisha. <laughs> they, I think I think it was going to signal something to somebody somewhere. Um, and then you have Jay who says something. Look, I wouldn't say what we say here in the support group and those other open or university groups and platforms. She said, because they don't know. Right. She said the people in the group know the struggle. And things like the struggle and the hustle come up a lot in the students that I talk to. What they're, t thinking, what they're talking about, I think, in that is a shared social uh, location, right? That I trust information. I don't have a lot of trust networks in this online space. I get that people think that my choice of college is really odd. So I don't trust talking to y'all about it either. You already think that I'm kind of stupid for being here. They say this to me, they know, right? They get that there's this perception that their uh, education is somehow inferior. So they're not gonna seek out any tacit or explicit information from those networks, but they do still need to trust where that information is coming from. And they're going to trust people who are similar to themselves, right? So I think this actually complicates several of the assumptions that we make. I think we assume that when we talk about um, online spaces as being democratized and we think anonymity is a net positive, right? Um, for my students, it isn't necessarily. It's a complicated negotiation with anonymity. They think that they are, it might matter to gatekeepers, to teachers and administrators and fellow students, but also there's no way for them to find each other in the struggle if they don't know who each other are. They can't find their people if they don't know who their people are. And we generally do that by how they look and how they reveal information about themselves. I think it also gets at this idea of how the context of how people are participating in, again, these sort of emerging higher education models effectively shuts them out of these other um, social processes that could remediate inequality. So I had the question back here about how much they're borrowing, right? And this is a, um, a very important. Again, a lot of this comes out, a lot of these relationships and these finer points come out when they're talking about debt and their concerns about it. Um, but there's something I'd like to point out. If I'm at Profit U getting my PhD online, I'm probably never going to get the Ford or NIH grant or institutional aid, right? They aren't really barred from participating, but the prestige hierarchy of institutions makes it very unlikely that they are gonna get the type of money that would help subsidize how much they have to borrow to pay for it, right? This is why institutional context matters and why who chooses to be where matters. So we can talk about the poor choices that people make. We can even talk about the predatory options available to them. But there are these interlocking systems of how we don't have to affirmatively exclude people to exacerbate, to exacerbate the issues that create the inequality. If we're concerned about student loan debt, we might also want to be concerned about the fact that you have to go to a prestigious uh, not-for-profit college to get the free or cheap money. I mean, that's one way we can intervene. I think there are reasons why we don't, but that's fine. All right. 
And then some takeaways about methods and ethics and future directions. There's been a lot of talk about methods and ethics lately um, in the media, so I just wanted to touch on that. I think that social media content um, can be used as event history diaries. That's effectively how I'm, I use them um, in this project and how I'm using them in others. Um, and I also think that university content, what they are producing in their online platforms should be viewed as institutional ethnographies. And that would include things like, again, reading those SEC filings, that creative nonfiction about how they create this idea of who and what they are. And more importantly, how those two rub up against each other and are in conflict with each other. That's where I get most of this information from students when I say, all right, let's look at your Facebook timeline over a while and let's pull out a few of these conversations and talk about them, right? So at first they might tell me, no, I've never had any problems with my teachers. I like everybody here and they're really supportive, right? And then we, we prime the memory a little bit and then we also juxtapose that with what the institution says they're providing you. Right? And when you start to put these things together, I think you get a much um, richer story of what's happening in these models that reveals, again, the, the way inequality gets uh, perpetuated. Multiple permissions at every stage of this process is critical. So I not only ask for permissions from group moderators, which tends to be some, unfortunately, where a lot of us stop, but you need to ask the other members of the group. I'm very open about the fact that I'm there. I've been a member of the group for some time, and I probably wouldn't do this any other way. I think it's important for us to share our research findings with the groups. I think that for us to better understand how inequality is happening in sort of these technocratic um, futures that are being imagined for us, we've got to do more comparative case studies and longitudinal studies, and we've got to do more qualitative work. I think there's a lot of potential here for quantitative narrative analysis methods as well. If you've got this huge amount of data and we're looking not just for task but for meaning, right? I think this is one way for us to get at some of that. Resource and all that stuff and crap is online. <laughs> and I'm happy to take questions, comments, discussion. Thank you very much. Several years ago, a colleague of mine was privy to a final examination that was being proctored at a major uh, public university. And at the end of the final exam, uh, they asked that particular student to show his or her ID. Mm -hmm. And they found that over 40% was not the person mm -hmm. that was taking the final examination. Right. Do you see any methodological issues with looking mm -hmm. at online education where you really don't know if that's exactly the person that's taking that yep. course? Yeah, so we talked about this um, uh, with the MOOCs and um, online learning session and uh, have talked about and read about that a lot with um, uh, with other researchers. Yes, I mean, so one of the things, that, so one of the distinctions I think we need to make in the research is one, that there's an extreme amount of self-selection that we cannot say that anything that we get from those findings can be generalized to any uh, larger student population for that reason and for the reason that we don't know that it's representative at all. And so I have a lot of questions about us using it in, in that way. Um, and unfortunately, I think we are using it in that way without interrogating sort of the methodological weaknesses of doing that kind of stuff. But I will say that, I mean, I want to be fair about, again, both the promise and the peril of using these methods, right, and for doing this type of research in online spaces. As you point out, this is a problem both um, in person and online, right? So the same way that we have had to try to develop mechanisms for doing it um, in real spaces, and um, people are going to kill me for saying that, but you know, you know what I mean. Uh, in geographic spaces, right? You have the same issues online. I don't, I don't think that it's specific to online spaces. It just probably has to be hap has to be addressed specifically in that context. Um, some of this gets into when people opt into some of these models, they're not really opting into a relationship with an institution, which is how we normally would go about getting that kind of information, right? They're op opting into content. They're not forming a student relationship. They're not being admitted to an institution. They're not filling out anything, right? So that becomes part of the problem, which again gets at the issue uh, increasingly of how we are collecting data. 
Um, so in many cases, uh, what we're what we're talking about when we talk about the people who are, for instance, taking MOOCs or doing um, online programs at for-profit colleges is is not the same type of institutional record keeping that we would have that we could match student records to student data um, in on-campus settings, and we need to be aware of that. Um, and I think it greatly limits the type of work we've been able to do with students in those fields. I have to go through a for-profit pro proprietary company to get access to students and overwhelmingly cannot get it right so I have to go about go about all kinds of other recruiting means to get at those students I can't go to the institutional review board at the University of Phoenix and ask and ask for permission to survey their students right and this becomes increasingly important seriously as we talk about these are the majority of students in higher education what kind of access do we have to them to even find out these types of things but even in terms of so-called race um, mm -hmm. That person can list that he or she is African American, Latino, and is a Euro American taking the course. Mm -hmm. You know, I can see as a further problematic aspect. Yeah, no. So. so we always so there's always a degree of um, you know self-reporting bias um, when it comes to trying to measure race, which is why I I subscribe to the idea that we shouldn't measure race as a single variable, right? So one of the things I actually I think point out here. So do I have, yeah, so this is what the composite renderings about group identities comes from. So I ask the students to self-report things like race and gender, um, but then I also do a qualitative narrative analysis with them. So I'm, I'm not just interested in how you self-identify, but how is it that you think people identify you, right? So I ask them questions like that, and I think you do get at a much different uh, concept of race when you do that. Race is a social location rather than this biological essentialist notion of race, right? And since what we're interested in is social inequality, I'm not interested in proving that there's something inherently inferior with groups of people, but instead their experience of the social world. I, I think this is one way to get at that. Um, so yeah, to combine those methods to try to get at a sort of richer idea of race. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Jessa. I'm from Microsoft Research. Hi, um, Jessa. Hey. Uh, thanks for that awesome talk. It was great. I just had a really quick question. Um, do, do students in your work, do they enjoy school? Is there any sense of pleasure in, in school? No, because that is important. Because it's really easy for us to sort of yeah. be like disparaging of it, but I'm genuinely mm -hmm. curious. Like, no, thank you actually for the opportunity to say that. So I actually uh, say that often. I, I do think it is important to know that the majority of the students I talk to are very proud of themselves and their education. By and large, they think that the problem is you, not them. Right, and they have a point to some extent. I mean, you know, we are part, all part of the problem. They're right. They're like, look, I did. I made choices that were available to me. I succeeded individually. I worked hard, and they're mostly measuring that by the amount of effort, and which is fair to do, right? I think all students uh, think that's an important part um, of their developmental process. So, no, by and large, they are happy. Um, if not overwhelmingly happy with their institutions, certainly happy with themselves. Yeah. Thank you for that. Hi, I'm Andromeda. Um, I teach librarians to code, sometimes mm -hmm. online, and the fact that most people are not roaming autodidacts has mm -hmm. become uh, painfully salient. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love that term, and I'm going to have to read more about that. Um, and and the placemaking concepts as well, because teaching people to code is much more affective than yeah. people give it credit for. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if you've seen people do particularly successful things to address mm -hmm. placemaking, to reach out to people who are not modeled as yeah. autodidacts. Yes. So um, not so much at an institutional level. I think that people are kind of hacking mm -hmm. away at solutions, sort of, you've got, um, I think you've got individuals and sort of these uh, collectives of people who are finding ways to do that, right? Um, so you've got people who are using the technology, but instead of being worried about it being massive, are trying to do it on a smaller scale, right? Um, or either confining that to region or to place or to group. And I think that students do better in those spaces, uh, it's, at least as it relates to, again, building so social networks and the sort of sharing of um, tacit and explicit information and emotional support through the process, right? Um, 
so yeah, I think a, a hybrid model tends to work best. But I mean, if we're again talking about the who is that available to? I mean, if what we're trying to do is we're trying to do an efficient use of time because I cannot physically travel to a place, right? We run into the same issues. But I think that there is merit to things like again, they find if students are finding each other based on uh, shared similarities. Um, and their experiences of education, maybe we should follow them in that process. I mean, that's obviously what students are interested in doing. We can develop institutional mechanisms to facilitate that. It would involve things like not getting rid of the comment section in online courses. It would involve things like helping students identify and find each other and building safe spaces online for them to do so, right? And incentivizing those things. So students are already doing it, which is kind of some of the point from my research. It's about whether or not we're going to develop the uh, mechanisms for them to do it. Hey, my name is Mary Graham from Microsoft Research. Um, so thank you for your talk. Thanks. And my question earlier, you made the comment that um, you see people opting into content versus an institution, mm -hmm. and I think you were specifically talking about MOOCs. But right. can you can you just tease apart the difference you see between? Um, opting into the for-profit institutions, I think this kind of links to what Jess was saying, mm -hmm. and where you see these online groups, um, these online spaces developing a connection to the institutions or these, uh, these participants kind of mm -hmm. parlaying that for a sense of is institutional connection. Yeah. Can you just yeah. talk a little bit about that? Um, so I think the so I think the question there is how are the students cobbling together something that they're not getting from the institution, yeah. Yeah. right? And what that speaks and what it then says about how they feel, uh, the extent to which they feel embedded in any institution. So yes, yeah, students do lose some sense of. Um, uh, identification and and this matters a lot to the students that I tend to talk to right so um, when you are resisting sort of this idea of yourself as not being a college student or uh, not participating sort of in the academic realm the identity of student is actually quite important and that's generally conferred by an institution and the students really desire that and want that so they uh, they mentioned things like getting their uh, student ID card right or all of these symbols of belonging to an institution that become fewer when you're doing that online, right? So they have fewer of those symbols, which is why I think they seek out ways where they can then enact that in other spaces. So you do see lots of um, visible signaling, like almost all of the students in this online group have some reference to their degree process in their username. It's, um, you know, um, future PhD so and so and so or blah blah right which I, I know I'm one to talk I'm, you can find me at Tressy MC PhD <laughs> on Twitter um, yeah <laughs> right which I love by the way and point that out to them all the time but you do see a lot of that visible signaling happening which I think is part of that of trying to say I belong to an institution and trying to develop a sense of embeddedness that they're not going to get from the institution because of the way it's structured and so they're defining it for themselves I think that's what the participation in the group is even about again the group is narrowly you could say that it was about it could have been a group for women in college right but instead it's a women pursuing a PhD Right. And that is very important to them saying, no, I'm in a group for women who are getting a Ph.D. It's another way to signal that and to build it and to sort of build those institutional identifications. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Bruce here. Hi, Bruce. This has been fantastic. Well, uh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm curious how much of this is generational. I think of how oh. students today versus 10 years ago, 20 years ago, oh. approach learning, approach being able to find groups in. Mm -hmm. in online spaces versus needing a physical location. How much is this is, is, is just in flux and they're going to stay in flux? That's a really good question and a hard one to answer. And I'll tell you why I think it's hard. And then we'll do some totally unscientific um, <laughs> a speculation, right? That's Excellent. That's exactly what we're going for, right? OK, I'm going to get my sociologist card revoked. We don't speculate. <laughs> but OK, so the first thing is, Generations are hard to understand in this context. I, 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 um, I mean, what are we going to call that? Like people born, you know, how are we going to anchor the concept of a gener of generations? And I, and then I think that gets in the idea that generationally people are sharing a, the same cultural milieu, and I'm not sure that they are. Right. Um, I, I'm not. I think we could take that for granted when the majority of students were coming from very similar class 
and socioeconomic backgrounds that I don't think we can take for granted anymore. So for instance, um, my 1970s will be quite different from somebody else's, uh, the same generational position. I think that what is more salient probably are those intersections with generation with all of the other stuff, race, class, gender, and where you're coming from. So it gets really hard to think of it that way. I will say that most of the students that I speak to tend to be in that, uh, tend to be in their 30s and 40s. I have some that skew a little older and younger. Usually that's determined by parental status. They're younger if they have children. Um, and then I have a few older students. And I, um, I'm not sure that they're identifying, I'm not sure they're choosing online spaces or have a different understanding of group formation processes online because of generation. I think they are doing it because of how their choices in other spaces are constrained. You know, yeah, but um, what I'm thinking of is that you know, I know some younger students who have much easier to form communities and groups online yeah. than an older generation, which is just not not as facile with the uh -huh. internet and, and online communities. Yeah, again, so again, I'm, I'm not, that just doesn't come out as much in the students that I talk to. I will, I will see younger students who are taking courses online who have a high amount of institutional distrust. Right. All right. Right. So, for instance, I have um, uh, one young lady who is not yet. She's not in her 30s. She has two young children. Uh, the participant I'm thinking about who did not want to talk to someone that she had met um, in her online class. They do meet once a year for like two days. They call it the residency period. Right. They come to this hotel and they meet each other. And someone there liked her and wanted to keep in contact with her afterwards. And she was like, no, he's weird people online. Like that was not at all. It was she was not into it at all. Actually. Actually. And then I asked some of the members in the online group if they had met offline in any, um, if, they, if these uh, relationships had extended in that way. And they all thought that was a huge violation. Like, what? No. Like, they would share this information in the space, but a phone call would have been very weird. Um, so, again, I'm not sure that that's what's happening. Yeah. Your. Uh... Yes. <laughs> um, so, this swag. Mm hmm. You said they mostly come from two institutions. Yes. Um, and the part of the problem is, how do you find this group? So I'm curious about, mm -hmm. like, is the group growing? Mm -hmm. And you've mostly talked about the groups supporting one another and sort of supporting their, their selves through mm -hmm. individual problems. Do they right. end up? you know, collectivizing to like advocacy or anything like that? Or how, how do they use the group? No, by and large, no. And this is actually a really great question. I've said for a very long time, that it's an interesting case study to be had for anyone who does work on campus student movements um, and whether or not students can form them anymore when they are in a, a, a market sector at college. Anyway, so if anybody wants that idea, clear. <laughs> somebody really has to write this thing and it can't be me is what I'm being told. So, the, so no, actually, and I think it's actually quite interesting that you don't see, um, you see collective identity building around the degree, not the institution. I think that's number one, right? We're PhD students, but we're not students at Profit U, right? That's the anchor for the identity. And then the second thing, though, um, again, so to the broader context of can students form any kind of collectivities in these spaces. And we don't have evidence that they can. I actually have evidence to the contrary, that some student contracts with for-profit schools and their enrollment agreements would not allow collective organizing of any kind. And then even if they wanted to, where would they do it? becomes another issue, right? Uh, and then, again, keeping in mind social location, we're already stretching beyond sort of all of my other competing social roles for me to do this. I'm also now supposed to become normal Ray, right? Like, so, I mean, if you had issues about time and space and vulnerabilities before, right? Like, this is not going to make that much better. Um, uh, so, no, actually, you don't see a lot of it. Yeah. No. Yes. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Zhang Tong. I come from China, Beijing mm -hmm. Normal University. Yes. I'm a master's student, and I, I can well remember that my supervisor once told me information does not equal to knowledge, oh. and knowledge does not equal to wisdom. Mm -hmm. So it is a perspective from Chinese people, and I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really interested. It's so noted and cited. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'm really interested in your your 
perspective of that, the relationship between information and not, uh, and education. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a theory called knowledge sociology, which mm -hmm. is from Manhattan, right? Yeah. Uh, but now in today's society, as you have mentioned before, everyone has the access right. to make the contribution to the knowledge. Mm -hmm. But who should become responsible mm -hmm. to act as the dog keeper? You mm -hmm. know that from the long history, a yeah. uh, thousand years, and all the knowledge we have learned today has been the has the background of some maybe mm -hmm. uh, so, um, political or economic oh, that's right. reasons. That's right. So, and what do you think about this? Yeah. You know? um, one, I would agree with the Chinese people. That's number one. <laughs> number two. So, so number two, I think the uh, so I think the prevailing um, belief is that somehow crowd that there that there is wisdom in the crowd. Right, and so I think our over reliance on sort of crowdsourcing of information will somehow take care of that archival filtration process for us, um, which is kind of like the dem democratizing of uh, veneer of uh, inequality, right? It sounds good, but something rankles there for you a little bit, right? And I think that what rankles is the idea um, that I'm not sure that the crowd will do that type of critical interrogation of those type, those very types of things, right? That everything that we sort of drag with us in our intellectual histories has um, a social, and economic, and historical context. And I think that we're probably better at crowd crowdsourcing information than we are critical analysis. Um, and that's just to be the personal being political there. Yes. Hi, so you had mentioned that you, oh, I'm sorry. All right, I'm, I'm mic'd now. So okay. You, you, had, you had mentioned that you had had a hard time uh, just getting access to uh -huh. students, and I, I would sort of think that that would be endemic to, yes. to the, the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, you know, Bruce had mentioned that you may sort of see an intergenerational thing. I'm wondering if you look to other spaces like Maybe there's a World of Warcraft clan mm -hmm. or whatever for yeah. kids who are in at Phoenix University yeah. or something like that. I'm just wondering, I, I would think that most everything is going to be designed a, away from getting these people to congregate. What mm -hmm. Do you think that there's any sort of hope mm -hmm. uh, for providing mm -hmm. atmospheres for them to congregate mm -hmm. in? and perhaps pursuing legislation such that, you know, I mean, the design of a website is very influential to the mm -hmm. kinds of interactions people have with it. And yes. increasingly, not just through education, but through our government, our mm -hmm. interaction with government agencies, it's all just go to this website. Mm -hmm. You are completely constrained by these forms. Right. Uh, how, how do you think that that can be worked around? Yeah, so the first thing is I would love for there to be some critical uh, um, in analysis and interrogation of platforms. Um, I'm right there with you, right? So for one, for us to, to um, question this, uh, the, the ideology that just putting things online somehow makes it available, that's one. But then I think there's the, yeah, the, the practical methodological process of us saying that there's lots built into platforms. And so um, one of the things I've thought a lot about with this project this summer, um, and again, especially increasingly as it's not just about, yeah, it's not just about self-selecting in the social interactions, increasingly for you to participate fully in sort of the, the, um, the civic realm, you've got to have, it's assumed that you'll have access to these things. And I think that's not the, um, not an accurate assumption. So, um, so to you, so the first part of your question about where people are, um, are meeting in spaces. So yeah, I actually have a lot of success with, there was a point at which where I had to say, okay, if I cannot go to the for-profit college and like sit in the, in the student lounge and recruit students, where else might people be who are also students, right? And it really just became about institution seeking what institutions are left. And so it became things like I go to lots of church groups have been particularly fruitful, right? So the church remains. And I go to places, um, I go to things like, um, uh, sporting um, kind of events, you know, people on sports teams, that kind of thing. And then it's just really, a, there's a lot of diffusion through social networks. So generally when I meet a student who's enrolled in for-profit college, um, she knows three or four more at work. Uh, two more in her church group, you know, one more in her neighborhood kind of thing. Um, and so people, yeah, they're, they're intersecting with these other institutions, but there's an extent to which these institutions just increasingly are not stable places for that type of um, gathering for people. And again, this produces a very particular problem, especially I think for sociologists who have always, there is an assumption about place in almost all of our, um, in the way that we measure almost everything. We assume people are in the same place. 
And I think that um, digital spaces are really going to push us to reconsider that theoretically um, and that we cannot take that for granted anymore. That's one of the major takeaways from my work and that you have to find the students where they are. And that does take a lot of sort of working around other institutional spaces. Yeah. And now what we can do about that. Yeah, we've. Um, I mean, look, so technology, if it's smart, is always out ahead of policy, right? That's kind of, I think, the point. Um, and so it does take us a while to catch up with how are we using these things, what are the, um, the effects of us using them in these ways, and then to catch up with anything that resembles legislation or policy. Um, I mean, look, there's a double movement action that happens in sort of social change, and I think hopefully we're getting close to the extreme of one and we'll start to figure out ways to push back. I mean, that's the historical pattern anyway. I'm not sure what it would look like. Yeah. Hi, my name's Bobby and I'm a big, Hi. I work here at Harvard. I'm a big fan of yours and I hope I don't lose my cred by asking this question. Sure, thank I you. Want, I wanted to circle back to something you said at the very beginning yeah. and the question I don't, didn't feel like you answered mm -hmm. uh, about, about um, enjoying yeah. studying. Uh, I, there's a lot of stuff I've been through in my life. I'm really proud of having survived it, mm -hmm. but I did not enjoy the experience right. at the time. Right. Um, I'm also old enough to have seen, you know, the whole credentialing movement mm -hmm. come in. Many, many of my colleagues would go and get higher and higher degrees in the hopes of expanding, but the right. intersectionality of their lives was such they weren't going to get anywhere right. anyway. Yeah. So I'm wondering, and this may be outside. The, uh, your your research clearly, but mm -hmm. you know, outside whatever, is is there a way for us to separate some of this credentialing out mm -hmm. from, or the whole concept of credentialing, out from the idea of getting of, of getting an education to the extent of going for a master's, going for a PhD. Right. Like how do we disrupt the cycle? Exactly. Right. Right. Um, uh, external shock. Uh, no, see, I've actually thought about it. It is outside of the realm of my immediate projects. You're right, but I've thought about it a lot. I mean, because these are the ends of the theorizing, right? So the, the, the very first time you start to realize that this race is sort of happening, right? You go, that can't go on indefinitely, right? Or uh, you like to think. I mean, there is a point where a terminal degree really is a terminal degree. Um, and as, as more people sort of reach that ceiling, like, what does that mean? I really do think that the process at this point to disrupt it, it's going to have to be external to the process of credentialing. One of the things that I think that could be is, again, if the institutions understand that they're in competition with jobs, we should understand that they're in competition with jobs. So I think <laughs> that probably one version of an external shock would be to improve the labor markets, right? If people have, the one way to change sort of the constraints on your educational choices is to not make it your only choice. Um, right, um, and then I can get real radical with you and talk about basic income and all that kind of stuff, but they might kick me out of here. <laughs> yeah, but if you're with me, then then yes, I, I, I get on that train. I really do. I think that um, fundamentally um, educational pol policy is economic policy. Uh, and to the extent that we focus on one and not the other, it is because we know that education won't push back. <laughs> it is the easier thing for us to tweak, but that doesn't mean that it is the most effective. So I think at some point you have to get to the uh, work the other side of the equal sign. Um, okay, um, hi. Hey. <laughs> uh, T.L. Taylor from I MIT. I packed the audience. I told them to see you. Thank you. T.L. Taylor from MIT. Um, thanks for a fantastic talk. Um, I wonder, can you situate into it, maybe it's a historical story, how community colleges mm -hmm. fit into this conversation? And, mm -hmm. you know, so do these institutions become places that are meeting needs that were previously unfulfilled, mm -hmm. or have things changed in the community college mm -hmm. scene that, yeah, so just yes. a broad question. Yeah, so we actually have the most literature there, and, and because community colleges view themselves as sort of juxtaposed against um, these models earlier, you know, sooner than did four-year colleges, right? Um, and so we actually, we've got um, most of the research in this area tend to start there and tends to go back the furthest there. So I, a, a few things happen. Um, um, there's the critique of community colleges and sort of mission creep, but I want to be very fair here about what mission creep was, and that is because community colleges were themselves a democratizing ideology at one point, right? They were the place where everybody could go. Um, and it was whether that was to complete a degree or to take a couple classes, as someone told me in San Francisco um, uh, Community College once. He was like, look, that's where you went to you figured stuff out. It was only going to cost you a couple hundred bucks. 
And so you might as well take a class, right? And it was a place to go. Again, place became really important. Community colleges served as one of these spaces, right? Um, but then a couple of things happened. Um, first, we just cannot underestimate the effect of declining public financial support for community colleges. At the same time that we expected them to redress just about every inequality we were producing everywhere else. So all of a sudden, you've got all of these inequalities that are coming out of K through 12 from tracking um, within school and between school segregation and all of these things. And where were you supposed to go to get remedial coursework? Everybody would tell you to go to a local community college. Well, as it turns out, uh, remediation is expensive and labor intensive because it does require people, right? And this is why we have found that online courses are not particularly good at 100 and 200 level courses where people's uh, inequalities and their prepara college preparation are most evident, right? Because that is labor intensive. In fact, you find for-profit colleges um, like Strayer, I think last year, dropped online uh, remediation courses in math for some of the students and said, no, now you're going to have to take it if you want to get into this program, you're going to have to take it on campus, right? Because their internal uh, uh, research said it is not a good model, it's not a good fit for remediating that. As an institution, that's entirely what community colleges are pretty much set up to do. So if you charge them with doing that, ramp up the, the amount of inequality that we're producing in those places, and then reduce the amount of financial support that we provide to them, what you've got are community colleges that are competing on 50 d different fronts, trying to remain politically and economically viable that's what created mission creep. And so they're trying to serve the political interest. Yeah, we're an incubator for uh, entrepreneurship this year because the governor really likes that. This year we're going to offer ballroom dancing because, you know, the legislature really likes that. And, you know, their fortunes are so greatly tied to their political relationships um, and the political whims of their states that the mission creep is just about them trying to manage that process. So, yeah, so that was the one thing. And, you know, and it constrained the amount to which they could respond um, to that demand. And then the other thing was people no longer could take time out of the job market to do it, right? The nature of the job market changed, right? Um, you have to constantly be either in a job or looking for a job with this amount of structural job change, and that is not conducive to going to a place every Tuesday from 2 to 4. Right. I know, but that's not very upbeat. I don't know. I, I need to end these things with pictures of puppies, and I never remember to bring the pictures of puppies. <laughs> I'm um, very sorry about that. Uh, the hopeful note is, again, we've been through worse. And again, I just I do think there has to be a resistance. And, I, and I'm very hopeful about the fact that we are close to that point. That is, that's my hopeful note. Anyone else? Are we going to see me? Yes. That's a quick question. Who do you think, like, of the different stakeholders, so policymakers, for-profit um, schools, students themselves, mm -hmm. really needs to see your research and really needs to understand it? Oh, wow. <laughs> Mine? <laughs> I wish I could get a few minutes alone. Oh, with the Senate subcommittee, I think. Uh, I think the Senate, the subcommittee, the health committee, uh, particularly as they're now getting ready to go, undergo a leadership change, uh, I think they're getting ready to lose their chair. I'm not sure who's going to take that over. And they've been very instrumental in kind of keeping this conversation um, sort of in the public awareness. And I wish that we could broaden that conversation to talk about things like connecting education policy to jobs policy and that kind of thing. And I think that might be the mechanism to do it. Um, so maybe that. And I would love to, I do this a lot anyway. I go to lots of church groups and the like. Again, the few places where people gather anymore, I wish we could be there more often having these kinds of conversations. Are there any, as a follow-up question, are there any cities you think have really interesting policies for sort of tying education and economics? At the city level, I'm not aware of some, um, so much. There's this uh, hope, I think, amongst policymakers right now that the real action is at the state level, because the federal level is just... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's got a few issues, is what I'll say, um, right? And so there's hope that states can make uh, more movements. Um, I mean, you know, I, th I think the states that have been most innovative, the not so good news is that those are the states that have less inequality to deal with. I mean, you know, if you can play around with innovation when, you know, your rate of inequality is a little lower, which is why I always think it probably takes a broader sort of um, jobs program or solution. But, I mean, I think that the stuff that they are, again, Connecticut, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, it's not representative of, again, um, inequality across the, um, across the nation. I have liked some of the things that were coming out of the CUNY system in New York, for instance. They at least acknowledge the fact that students are making choices amongst 
for-profit schools and their own and have tried to put things in place to help counsel them um, should they want to transfer and have been willing to take their credits and the like that other systems have not been willing to do and that broadens the choices available to those students. Um, so yeah, there's some piecemeal things, yeah. Anyone else? If not, thank you so very much for coming out. I greatly appreciate it.